God bestows on us the grace to give. There are wonderful blessings that result when we give. Most of all, it demonstrates our faith in the gospel and that God is able to give us more than enough. So let's all raise up our Bible together and say this out loud, bold and strong. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am what God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe His word. And I live by His word. Christ is my master, and to him I am an absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Why don't you turn around to people next to you, say hello, greet them, and you may be seated, please. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to spend two Sundays, today and the coming Sunday, Talking about generosity, or in other words, we're going to talk about giving. Now, uh, before we do this, I just want to make a few statements, uh, more like disclaimers. <laughs> uh, before we start talking on the subject, uh, you know, the way we plan things at APC is... Uh, in December of the previous year, we plan for the 52 Sundays of the coming year. So we already planned to talk about generosity in December of last year, right? So that's the first thing I want to just say. Now, of course, as we go along, uh, you know, we make some adjustments. For instance, uh, in our plan in December that we did last year, for this 2018, we planned four Sundays to talk about the holiness of God. Uh, but as we go along, we find, okay, we need an extra Sunday to cover that. And so we actually spent five Sundays on, that, uh, on the series that we just concluded on the holiness of God. Uh, one of the things we planned was to do one Sunday on generosity, but we're actually going to do two Sundays on generosity. So slight adjustments we make as we go along, right? Now, why am I taking time to say that? Because uh, next month, we're going to be doing a fundraising for purchase of land. But these two are not connected. <laughs> In other words... Uh, this message on generosity was already planned in December last year. <laughs> and later on, I think it was in February that, you know, a team, we put a small team together of five people from a congregation who would uh, spend their time uh, looking for land and all of that. And they've been working very hard, very diligently on that. And one of the things the team decided was, okay, let's start raising the money to buy the lands. And so that will roll out in June. So in one way, I'm really happy, really amazed how all of this has come together. It wasn't planned, but it's all coming nicely together. But I'm saying all this so that you don't feel like, oh, a pastor preached to message so that we'll... <laughs> it is, it's not hap I mean, it wasn't planned that way, all right? So just to uh, clarify that. But in any way, it will help us do well next month <laughs> when, when we do uh, when we do roll out the fundraising uh, for the land and so on so uh, that will it, it'll serve as well one thing I want to do say is I want to make mention is right from the time we started back in 2001 uh, God has really blessed us as a church and as a congregation uh, we really have never struggled for finances uh, there's never been a time we've had to tell people you know please give us money otherwise you know, we can't pay this or we can't do that. There's never been a time, these 17 years, uh, we just want to thank God for that. As a congregation, I know people have come and gone. People have moved to various parts of the world. But as a congregation, uh, God has really blessed us, graced us uh, with that ability to give. And uh, as a church, we've been blessed that way. We've been able to give out to our nation uh, all of these 17 years. Uh, uh, and I have had more than enough for ourselves and to bless others with. So uh, 
this series that we're doing to, uh, today and next Sunday on generosity is not coming out of any sense of desperate, uh, desperate need or things like that. It's just uh, something that we felt we needed to do. We just thought about, I mean, it, uh, it was part of our plan in December last year that we will talk about uh, generosity uh, uh, through the course of 2018. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to cover two passages of Scripture. The first one is in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, chapters 8 and 9. We'll try to cover that. And then we will try to get into Philippians chapter 4. Uh, this morning, 8 o'clock service, I could not get it anywhere close to Philippians. <laughs> we just barely managed 2 Corinthians 9. So we'll see how we do uh, here in the 1030 service. Uh, so let's do that. And... Uh, the service today, in our message today, we will be talking about some insights on giving, uh, on the spiritual side of giving. Uh, what is it? Uh, how do we do it? Uh, but next Sunday, we'll get into the practical side. You know, how much should I give? Where should I give? Uh, and how should I give? We'll get into those kinds of things next Sunday. So let's start off in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We'll go verse by verse, verse 1, and we'll make comments as we go along. We'll try to cover uh, both these chapters, chapters 8 and 9. Let's read from verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. So Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he's talking about churches in Macedonia. So just for a little bit of geography, uh, uh, where is this region? So if you look at the map, uh, this is the map during Paul's time, if you can see it. But what would be now the west coast of Turkey? Uh, there was a seaport town called Troas. So Paul, in a second missionary journey, he and his team, arrive at Troas, and uh, they're deciding where to go next. Uh, and you read about this in Acts 16. Uh, so Paul and his team, they're praying, they're thinking about going into Asia. They're going, planning to go east into Asia. But then they have a vision. And in a vision, they see a man from Macedonia, that is across the agency on the other side, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. So Paul and his team, they leave Troas, they sail, go across the agency, come into a seaport town on the other side called Neapolis. And so Macedonia is that region north of Greece. If you look at the modern day map there, if you just go to the Google map today, you'll see. So you see Turkey, you go across and you see Greece, north of Greece, you see Thessalonica, and Macedonia. You all will see that? Yeah. So that's the region he's talking about. Now, that area had several important cities that Paul went through, some of which you'll be familiar with. Philippi. They came to Philippi. Uh, from Philippi, they went over into Thessalonica. Uh, and then they also went to Berea. So these are three main cities that you and I are familiar with. Paul wrote the epistle to Philippians. He wrote the epistle to Thessalon Thessalonians. Uh, and Berea, the believers there in Berea, uh, we know that they were very, uh, they were people who were very conscious of the word. They really studied the word. And of course, there were a couple of other smaller towns that they also passed through. Uh, so that's the region he's talking about. So now in verse 1 of, Act, of 2 Corinthians 8, he says, The grace of God that was on these churches. So he's saying, look, uh, uh, Corinthians, I want to tell you something about God's grace that was on these believers in Philippi, in Thessalonica, in Berea. You all with me so far? All right, let's go on. What, do, what does he say about these believers? Verse 2. That in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. So Paul is kind of talking about the believers in Macedonia, the believers in Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, and other towns. He's talking about them to the Corinthians. He says, I want you to know something. These people were in great affliction. I mean, they pay, face a lot of persecution. And you remember when Paul was in Philippi, he and his team were thrown into jail. From Thessalonica, they were driven out. From Berea, they were driven out. And these believers face a lot of trial, persecution. So he says, out of much persecution and their own deep poverty. That means they were not rich believers, not well-to-do believers. They themselves were, you know, just making it by. It says, out of the persecution, great trials, out of their own deep poverty, they were willing to participate in this thing. So what Paul was doing at that time was, he was 
collecting money to help the believers who were in Jerusalem. At that time, Judea, Jerusalem and the whole district of Judea went through famine. Uh, Agabus, the prophet, prophesied about this in, 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 in Acts 20. Uh, and so they had gone through a time of famine. And so Paul was trying to raise up support from other churches to help the believers who were in need in Jerusalem. So now he's writing to these believers and he's saying, Corinthians, I want you to know something about Macedonians. Though they, were, they had a lot of persecution, they themselves were poor. According, verse 3, according to their ability and beyond their ability, they were ready to help. And they wanted us to receive this gift, verse 4, end of verse 4, the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. They wanted to participate in ministering to the saints. So now, there are many ways that we can minister to God's people. We can minister to the word. We can minister through you know, so many different things. But one very important way that we can minister to the saints is through giving materially to their lives. You all with me? Yeah? So now, this is something all of us can do. That we can all give in order to bless God's people, other people. Uh, and this is a ministry that we can all participate in. So, let's continue. Verse 5. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So when you give yourself to God, then giving out of your finances or material things is not a problem. Because you've already given yourself to God. So they first gave themselves to God and then to us. And then they gave themselves by the will of God. That's the second thing I want to point out to you. First, our giving must be an expression of our own yieldedness to God. You've given yourself to God. So God, now if you want me to give part of this money that I have, that's fine. And second, it's that you give according to the will of God or the purpose of God. Now, here's something I want to mention. You don't have to give according to what your neighbor is giving. Right? So your neighbor may want to give to take care of poor people. But you may want to give for some other cause, something else. And that's fine. Because each one gives according to to the will or the purpose of God working through us. Amen? And the way God is working through you, or the purpose God is working through you, may be different from the purpose God is working through believers around you. So don't, this is not, a, 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 it is that there's no need to compete or compare yourself with other believers. Are you with me? It's according to the will of God working through your life. The same thing uh, with us as a church. There's a certain purpose that God is working through us as a church. And, and we give according to that. Now verse 6. So we urge Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. So he's saying, okay, um, Titus is coming to finish up the collections. So he's sending Titus. We'll talk a little bit more about Titus later. But what I want you to point out, a couple of things, is verse 7, he says, you know, you abound in everything. So as a church, saying, you guys, you're abounding in faith. You're abounding in, in knowledge. Uh, maybe, you know, they, they were abounding in speech and, and how they could express and communicate the word. Uh, they were uh, diligent in many things. They were diligent in love. But he says, see that you are bound in this grace also. So in every area, including our generosity, we should keep growing and abound. You with me? Amen? Now, three times in these verses that we read, three times you find the word grace. Verse 1, and uh, again in verse 6, and again in verse 7. The ability to give is the grace of God that is bestowed on your life. Amen? 
God's grace on your life is what enables you and me to give according to the grace bestowed on you, your gift. It's the same thing, you know, when we talk about, there's the same Greek word, charis, that's used about the gifts of the Spirit, you know, the charisma, gifts, empowering, spiritual empowering. So giving is also a spiritual empowering that God puts on our lives. Amen? So in as much as we are zealous of ministering through the gifts and so on, let us also be zealous in ministering through the grace of giving, that is generosity. Let's bless people. Say, Lord, whom can I bless through this grace? The grace of generosity. And so there is grace that God puts upon us as individuals, empowers us as individuals to give. There is grace that God bestows on us as a church to be able to give. Amen? And as a church... Our giving, of course, is aligned to the purpose of God through us. Our primary or one of our major purposes as a church is to equip the people of God. So a lot of the giving that we do is aligned to this. To equip churches across our nation. So one major way this happens, and I'm just sharing these things with you so that you're aware. Otherwise, you know, be like, okay, well, how, how are we doing this? So one major way that we walk in this grace that is bestowed on us uh, to equip other churches through our publications. Uh, right from the beginning, we've been giving our publications out across the country for free. And literally thousands and thousands of uh, our publications in different languages are being used across the country in churches, in conferences, uh, for training. Uh, just some examples. One pastor from Delhi, the head of our network, uh, they have about 110 congregations under them, Pentecostal uh, denomination. Uh, he called us. He said, I want 1,000 copies of your marriage and family book. 1,000. And this is a pretty big book. <laughs> uh, I want to give it to all my pastors and all the second level leadership. We want it. So we printed specially for them, sent it at no charge. You know, we let them give if they want to, but we don't charge for it. Right? Uh, this oh, CNI pastor, Bishop from Nagpur, he said, I need copies of Code of Honor. I want to give it to all the pastors in my diocese. Send it. Uh, so like this, there are different people, who they ask for bulk of our books, and of course we place it in bookstores around the country, but we also send it in bulk to churches, congregations, conferences, and people use these resources for equipping, and we don't charge. Now, so imagine, every time you make an offering here, it's going out to the nation. I mean, not because, I'm not trying to take an offering, I'm just saying, <laughs> this is what happens to what we give to APC, it's blessing the nation. This Last week, a pastor from Pune said, I want to run a 15-day Bible school for young people here in Pune. Uh, what can I use? And so I gave him a list of books. I said, you use all this. Just teach. Take it. Use it. You know? So churches, congregations are using these resources. Uh, our conferences that we hold around the country, we don't tell people to pay any money. It's free. Pastors come and attend the conferences. Maybe we take a little registration fee for covering the food. But beyond that, we don't. So they, they are able to participate. These are pastors who can, you know, even, they don't even have money to travel between town to town or places. But they attend these conferences. Or the youth conferences. The youth conference that we'll be having in Gujarat. You know, imagine these three to 500 young people who've been ministered to out of the tribes. They're coming to attend the conference. So a lot of our giving across the nation happens aligned to equipping the church. Are you with me? Because it's a grace bestowed on us and we do it according to the purpose of God through us. But we don't run orphanages around the country. There will be other organizations or other ministries that might do that. But our giving is aligned towards equipping people, equipping churches, equipping leaders, equipping youth, ministering God's word and God's spirit into their lives. And that's how a lot of the giving happens through us. But it is the grace of God. God's grace whether it's on us as individuals or on us, us as a church, it's God's grace on us that enables us to do that. Let's go on. Verse number eight. I speak not by commandment, but I'm testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. Interesting. He says, I don't, I'm not speaking by commandment. In other words, I'm not commanding you to do this. And that's important. Because sometimes preachers command. 
you must give 1000 rupees or 10000 whatever no that's not the way to do it paul says i do not speak as commandment i'm just trying to see the sincerity of your faith talking to you about the macedonians that's all so he's not i'm not commanding you verse 9 and he points them to Jesus. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. So he says, look at the example of Jesus. He had it. He became poor. He emptied himself in order to bless us so that he could lift our lives up. That's the example we follow when we give. We've got, we give, so we can lift other people up. Are you with me? He says, look, that's the, that's the whole story of giving. Look at the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10. And in this I give advice. It is to your advantage, not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you also must complete the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion of what you have. For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack and their abundance also may supply your lack, that there may be equality as it is written. He who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. So basically what Paul is saying in, this, in, in these verses is, uh, I'm encouraging you to complete what you intended to do. You know, you intended to give, now complete it. You know, go, go through, follow through with action. The second thing he points out is, you know, you give according to what you have, not according to what you do not have. That's interesting. Did you notice that? That was in verse 12. You have a willing mind. You're ready to give. And all we want you to do is you, according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. Now, I'm going to make a statement that you can differ with if you want to. and That's fine. That is, don't go into debt in order to give. Don't go into debt in order to. But yes, yes, I want to give. So I'll borrow from Peter and I'll give to James. <laughs> hey, now you still have to pay back Peter. Don't go into debt in order to. Because you give according to what you have, not according to what you don't have. So, but he gave thousand. I also want to give thousand. Okay, how much you have? Hundred. How much can you give? Hundred. Fine, give that hundred. Tomorrow, or sometime in the future, you will have the capacity to give a thousand. Sometime in the future, you'll have a capacity to give ten thousand. That's fine. But today, you give according to what you have, not according to what you don't. Is it okay? Now, if you want to defer with that, that's fine. That's, that's your choice. But I'm just saying, <laughs> give according to what you have. Don't go into debt in order to give. Just God is looking at what you have and what you can give out of that. Now, and the other thing we see here in this passage, verses 14 through 15, is that your abundance supplies somebody else's lack. Somebody else's abundance will be used to supply your need at your point in time of need. God will use that. And so, Everyone's need is taken care of. So in God's economy, in God's kingdom, God knows how to distribute resources to meet the needs of people. Now we all pray, oh God, give me this day my daily bread. So God will use somebody else's abundance or some other means or source to meet your need. He will use out of the abundance you have, you give. He will use that to meet somebody else's need. And God takes care of all of our needs. As we all participate in this grace of giving. Amen? Now let's go on, verse 16. But thanks be to God who puts the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus. 
For he not only accepted the exhortation, but being more diligent, he went to you of his own accord. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. So he's talking about Titus. And then verse 18, he's talking about another brother. We don't know his name. But he has a good report. His praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And not only that, but who was also chosen by the churches to travel with us with this gift, which is administered by us to the glory of the Lord himself and to show your ready mind. Avoiding this, that anyone should blame us in this lavish gift which is administered by us. Providing honorable things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. And we have sent with him our brother. So he's talking about another brother, whom we have often proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent because of the great confidence which we have in you. If anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker concerning you. Or if, or if our brethren are inquired about, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. Therefore, show to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. Now, this whole passage here is, is important. Paul is just talking about three men. He's talking about Titus and two others whose names are not given. But what he's trying to say is this. He's saying, look, we're sending three people to come to you and take this offering and bring it over to Jerusalem. But these three men are certified men. I mean, they are men of character, of good repute. Titus, he's my partner, he's my fellow worker. The other man, uh, he, his praise is in the gospel among all the churches, meaning all the churches know him and they have a good report about him. The third man, again, whose name is not given, he is a very diligent man. He's very meticulous in his work. He's very committed to his thing. So we are sending these three people and these other two men, their glory, they, um, they are you know, messengers of the churches. They are ambassadors of the churches. Why is Paul emphasizing this? And he spent so many, I mean, writing about this in so many verses. Because of verse 21, he says, we must provide things honorable, not only in the sight of God, but also before man. So why am I talking about all this? Paul? Why is Paul writing all about this? Because he says, look, I want you to know that in our collection, in our handling of this money, we want to be right in the sight of God and also in the sight of man. Now this is something very important uh, for us as a church, as individuals and as ministries. It's not enough to say I'm right in God's eyes. You've also got to be right in the eyes of man, people. Because it's their money that you are handling. Or the money that God has blessed them with, which they're giving to you, you're handling that. So you've got to be right in the sight of God and in the sight of man. Now, as a church, we've really, you know, we've, we've been careful right from our day one, from our very first service in 2001 till this day, everything has been accounted for. Everything's been accounted for. All our accounts, our annual uh, audited reports are available on our church website right from the first day till now. Every year it's put up. So anyone who wants to go see can see it. Well, how much money came, where it went, it's there. Right? Why are we doing that? Why do we do that? Because we want to be accountable not only in the sight of God but also the sight of man. We have our accounts. Uh, we have an accounting firm handling our accounts and our accounts are also audited, audited independently right from the first day. We want to be clear. Right? So, so the government can't come and point the finger at us. And sometimes Christian organizations get into trouble and they say we are being persecuted. You're not being persecuted. You just didn't take care of your accounts. The government is doing their job. Right? Now there is some realm or some area where you know, definitely, uh, you know, things c could be unnecessarily interfered with. But generally, if you, as, a, as organizations, if we keep our accounts proper, then there's nothing uh, that nobody can point a finger at us. And we've tried to do that uh, well as, as an organization. We try to continue uh, to do that. But I want to highlight that. Why is Paul talking about the kind of people whom he has put in charge of this whole offering? Why is he doing it? Because he says we want to be honorable 
in the sight of God and man. Now, uh, in chapter 9 is when he gets into the whole thing about giving. And so let's get in there. Chapter 9, verse 1. Now concerning the ministering to the saints. So he says, I've given you all the background information. Let's get in. Concerning the ministering to the saints. So this is ministering to the saints in, through the grace of giving. It is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians. So now he's telling them, look, I've been talking about you to the others. To the church in Philippi and uh, Thessalonica and Berea, I've been boasting to them about you. That Achaia, Achaia was the name of the district of the region where Corinth was located. That Achaia was ready a year ago and your zeal has stirred up the majority. Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that as I said, you may be ready. Lest if some Macedonians came with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. So, he's saying, guys, I've been boasting about you to the Macedonians. Now, please don't disappoint me and don't put yourself in bad light. Uh, get the offering ready. Uh, and so I'm sending these three brethren, Titus and the other two brothers. But look at the end of verse 5. It says, do this as a matter of generosity. The Greek for generosity is eulogy. Now when you you'll give or present a eulogy, a blessing, a word of blessing, you are, are just blessing somebody. You're generously speaking good about them. So he says, do this as a matter of blessing and not of grudging obligation. The word grudging obligation, the word in the Greek is, could mean not out of fraudulence and not out of extortion. So when you give, I think as you're doing this, do it because you want to bless. Don't do it because somebody's cheating you into it or somebody is pulling or extorting or forcing money out of you. Amen? Give because you want to be a blessing, not because somebody's cheating you into it or somebody is forcing you out of it. Are you with me? So, hey, when you go to a service where you find the preacher trying to cheat you into something, or if you find the preacher trying to force you into it, you don't have to give. You don't have to give. Because you give as a matter of blessing. And I'll share this little story with you. I've shared it in times past, so some of you may have heard it before. This was a time when we were living in Chicago. And uh, uh, we had just moved into Chicago, and Amy and I, we went to a certain church. Uh, you know, just trying to find a local church to uh, become part of. So we went to this church. They had a beautiful campus, nice lake, everything, beautiful, you know, uh, facility. And we went there. And I was sitting right up in the second row, right? Uh, at that time, Joshua was very small. He was in the stroller, so Amy had to spend some of her time outside the church, <laughs> outside the service, taking care of Josh. But I was sitting right up there. And so we had, there was a guest speaker. He came, and of course, the church was uh, at that time raising money, you know, for the facility. Uh, and so this man, he was a prophet. So he came, and he had a wonderful ministry. It was, it was flowing in the prophetic, and there was wonderful singing. He had wonderful voice. He was singing nicely. Then he started ministering and preaching. He preached from the Old Testament and all that. Um, then he came to the end of the sermon and he said, the Lord is telling me there are five people here who must give $10,000. Please stand up. And when I hear those kind of things, my alarm goes. Like, God, this is not the way to do it. So at that moment, I decided I am not giving in the offering today. Because you've got to give in order to bless, not because you're being extorted. So now, two people very reluctantly stood up. And I was counting. You know, how many people say? He said, the Lord said, five people. Only two people stood up. <laughs> and that was so reluctantly. He's like, okay. Then he moved on. He said, ten people. God is saying, ten people must give $5,000. Few people stood up, not ten. <laughs> I was watching what's happening. And so the amount kept coming and slowly the entire congregation was standing up, you know. And finally he came down $100. 
Okay, more people stood up. I said, I am not giving anything in the offering today. Now, it's pretty embarrassing because, you know, people around you are standing up. <laughs> and finally, he came down to one dollar. And he's looking at me. I'm the only one still sitting. Everyone around me are standing. And he's look, I'm on the second row. He's looking right at me. One dollar. I said, I am not giving. <laughs> so he repeated several times. One dollar. I mean, he must have, could somebody help this poor fellow? <laughs> Even if somebody had given me one dollar, I would not have given it in the offering. <laughs> I had decided I am not giving in the offering today. Why? Because of what the Bible says. You give it as an intent to bless, not out of grudging obligation. Now, there was a lot of pressure that moment. <laughs> I mean, whole church standing. This man's looking right at you. Uh, he's going on one dollar, one dollar. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting. <laughs> I don't know what you want to do. I'm sitting. <laughs> so finally, he closed the service. They went on. They collected the money, whatever. But I don't know what, you know, he would have gone on preaching other places and done the same thing. I don't know. But for me, it was simply a matter of principle. What does the Word of God say? God's Word says you give and as an act of blessing, not as a grudging obligation. Right? So, keep that in mind. You don't have to be forced into giving anything. And these days, you know, there's so many ways people try to force believers to do it. And I, I think you should not. Give in order to bless. Don't give because you're being cheated into it or forced into it. Next verse. Verse 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So it's very interesting. Giving into God's kingdom is sowing. And sowing, whenever it is done right, always results in multiplication. Is that right? Sowing always results in multiplication. That's it. So, giving into God's kingdom, when it's done right, when you're giving it in order to bless, will always result in multiplication. Think about it. That when you give, Something is not being subtracted from your life or divided out of your life. Something is actually being set up to be multiplied back into your life. And so he says, if you sow more seed, you'll have more multiplied back to you. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Verse 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful Giver. So, he's talking about two ways to give, two ways not to give. You give as you purpose in your heart. Don't give in order to look nice. Don't give in order to compete with somebody. What, what do you purpose in your heart? Just give. As you purpose. Give as you purpose in your heart and give cheerfully. Two ways not to give. He says, don't give grudgingly <clears throat> or out of necessity. Don't give grudgingly. That means feeling sorry that you have to give, complaining that you have to give, murmuring that you have to give, resenting that you have to give, not happy that you have to give, regret that you have to give. Don't give grudgingly. And he says, don't give out of compulsion, being forced to give or giving it as a duty or as an obligation or being, you know, uh, coerced into it. Don't give it. So give cheerfully, give out of your own heart. We'll look at two more, maybe till verse 10 and then we will stop. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Now think about that promise there. If you give, here's what will happen to you. God will make all grace abound toward you. 
so that you will have abundance to give, to do whatever you've been called to do. God will so bless your life. Isn't that wonderful? That when you give, you're actually positioning yourself to be a recipient of such grace, abounding grace, that you'll have more than enough, all sufficiency in all things, and abundance for every good work. And then he quotes from Psalm 112, verse 7, uh, in verse 9, talks about the righteous man who just is very generous, he gives to the poor. And then let's close with verse 10. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So now God does four things. God gives seed to sow. He gives bread to eat. He multiplies the seed you sow and he increases your fruit. All right? God does these four things. He gives us seed to sow, bread to eat. He multiplies your seed and he increases your fruit. So there is seed that has to be sown. And there is bread that you can eat. But don't eat your bread and your seed. Then you're saying, God, nothing's happening. Nothing's multiplying. Hey, the seed is meant to be. Bread is meant to be. That means, in what comes into your hand, you need to know how much is the bread that you can eat and how much is the seed for you to Otherwise, you eat the whole thing. <laughs> All of it is bread. Then there is no seed to. Then there's nothing to multiply. And there is no fruit. So in what comes into your hand? Every time something comes into your hand, and God blesses you with, that represents seed and bread. There is seed in it, and there is bread in it. Bread you enjoy. But there's also seed in it. Apple. There's a part that you eat and there is seed that you... Right? The seed is in the fruit. The seed is in the... So where is my seed? It's in the fruit. I mean, it's what came into your hands. That's the fruit that you have right now. But the seed is in the fruit. The bread is also there. You enjoy. But there is seed in it. Now sometimes we eat seed, fruit, everything. <laughs> then, hey, there's nothing to multiply. But just keep this in mind. Everything you receive, part of it is seed, part of it is bread. You eat the bread, you sow the seed. Then what does God do? He multiplies the seed that you and he increases the fruit. What comes back into your life? He increases the fruit. With increased fruit, of course, you have increased bread and you have increased seed. Enjoy the bread. Sow the seed. Amen? Next Sunday, we'll talk about the practical side of this. How much do I give? How do, where do I give? And so on. Right? Let just remember this. God has set something in place. As far as our money is concerned. Where we can bless one another. We can bless the purposes of God through our lives. And we can position ourselves to receive grace. Like it says in verse 8. That God will make all grace abound toward you. That you will always have all sufficiency in all things. And you'll be able to abound to every good work. Amen? And I can testify that, close with this, I can testify that about us as a church. You know, when we go around the country ministering, people think we are funded, we have lots of money coming from America. People always ask, Pastor, I have one question. How do you print and give these books for free? I say, I don't know. Money comes, it happens. But zero money from outside India. I tell them, there is zero money from outside India. Everything we are doing is from within our own nation. And I tell them very clearly, we don't even have a bank account from which we can receive money from outside India. We don't have the permits, and we don't need it. God has blessed us. Amen? 
So everything we're doing. So, so how is that happening? Even I can't figure it out. But every time we reach out for more, there is more flowing in. We reach out to do more, there is more flowing in. I can just say, God has made all grace abound towards us. That we as a church, having all sufficiency in all things, are able to abound to every good work. Everything in its season, but God is faithful. Amen? And he can do that for all of us. Let's stand to our feet, please. I want to take a few moments, please, before we close, just to pray over your own lives. And I understand. Could I just have the worship team up, please? And I understand some of us may be actually going through difficult times financially or you're in certain areas of need. And, but you know, God has made a way for all of us to position ourselves to live this kind of a life where we can say, God has made all grace abound toward me that I always having all sufficiency in all things am able to abound to every good work. God has made it possible for each one of us. So where you are today is not your destination. You are in transition. You can move out of where you are. If your situations are difficult, you can move out to a better place. But you and I need to practice what the Bible says. You give of what you have. Eat the bread, sow the seed. And God is faithful to his word. Father, in Jesus' name, I just want to pray, Father, I pray for every person here. Our homes, our families, our circumstances, our situations. And I pray especially, God, for individuals, our families, who might be in difficult times financially. And Father, I pray your grace upon them. We pray grace upon them. Grace that will enable them to come out of their difficult times. That they will come to this place that they can say, God has made all grace abound toward us. That we always having all sufficiency in all things are able to abound to every good work. As you stand here before God, would you just pray and say, God, I give myself to you first of all. I give myself to you. See, God is not after our money. He wants our hearts. He wants us. So you say, God, I give myself to you. And in response for your unspeakable gift, what you've done for me in Christ, I will honor you with my money. But I give myself to you first. If there's anyone here this morning and you need to make a commitment to Jesus Christ, your personal life, I'm not talking about your money, I'm talking about you, your life not right with God, your life is not in the hands of Jesus, then would you pray right now and say, Lord, I give myself to you first. I give myself to you. Father, I pray you will touch the lives of those individuals, God, right, right standing right here. We're praying that prayer. Lord, I give myself to you. Minister to them personally. Work in their lives powerfully.
turn their situations around, do a mighty work in their lives, be glorified in each of our lives. Thank you, oh God. Thank you. Thank you. Father, we pray that your power will let work will be at work in each of our lives, our circumstances, our situations, turning our financial situations around. Bless us so that we can be a blessing. Increase us so that we can give more for the sake of your kingdom. So that we can be a greater blessing to people, we pray. For that very reason, bless us. So we could be a blessing. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's close. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit continue with each of us on ways. bless you. Have a great Sunday, great afternoon and see you again. Thanks. God bless you. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.